polygamy is sin. We've heard that a lot. We hear that uh, particularly from the church um, and church doctrines. And the correct answer would be yes and no. So let's take a let's take a look. Let's explore what this uh, what the word polygamy, what all of this actually is all about. What Scripture actually says. This is going to be just kind of a quick, brief overview that uh, rolls through a little slide presentation I put together. Okay, so we will run to the next slide and get started here. According to the dictionary, the definition of polygamy is marriage in which a spouse of either sex may have more than one mate at the same time. Okay, and notice right here it says compare polyandry and polygyny. Okay, so we need to do a little more digging, right? Basically just using the word that is, uh, that's commonly used, polygamy, is insufficient. So if we do a little bit of digging, what we find is that the word polygamy is actually an umbrella term that uh, holds three different items under the umbrella. You've got polyandry, polyamory, and polygyny. So let's take a look at what each of those are. Polyandry is multiple men and one woman. This picture right here, I think, is of a Tibetan family. Uh, it's not an uncommon uh, circumstance in Tibet for whatever reason. I'm not sure why. Um, and we know that historically or anthropologically across the world, there are roughly 15 known polyandrous uh, subcultures where you've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 or 900 known uh, polygynous cultures out of, um, out of a total of maybe 1,200 identified cultures. So polygyny holding the major, polyandry being unusual. According to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, adultery is when a man sleeps with another man's woman. So by definition, uh, this is a circumstance where a woman cannot have more than one husband or more than one man. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9 is an example where David is specifically addressed by Yahweh for uh, sleeping with uh, Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Other uh, scriptures that would contradict polyandry as a form of marriage or form of family would be Leviticus 19.19 19, that talks about mixing seed. Um, not supposed to be mixing seed in a field, okay? Um, as it relates to man, the progeny that a man produces, his children are considered, according to Scripture, to be his seed. And so if more than one man is planting seed, to use the term, uh, in a field, then you don't know whose resultant son or who the resultant son belongs to. And God is very particular about maintaining genealogy and lineage, etc. But probably the most important one, Deuteronomy 22.9 is also about mixing seed. 1 Corinthians 11.3 is probably the most important one, and it has to do with uh, confused authority, where the authority structure is God, Messiah, man, woman. And so a woman that has two men would be in a confused authority situation because they would, or a man is to have authority over a woman. The end result is a confused circumstance where there's not a head or the head is bouncing back and forth between a couple. So according to scripture, polyandry would qualify as sin. Another of those umbrella terms is polyamory, polyamory, or many loves. Um, polyandry comes from, to flip back real quick, polyandry comes from the Greek poly, many, and andros, meaning man or husband or men, husband. So polyandry would be many men and one woman. Polyamory is many loves. Um, Leviticus 20.10 expressly uh, 
restricts men from having relationships with other men. A uh, man is not to lie with another man. Uh, Levitic, I'm sorry, that's Leviticus 18.22. Leviticus 20, verse 10. If there's a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 19.19 19 also refers to mixing seed. Nobody knows who's with who. Uh, likewise, Deuteronomy 22.9. Um, and as with polyandry, uh, 1 Corinthians 11.3, this yields a very confused authority structure. Nobody knows who's in charge. Nobody knows who is responsible for who. Um, and though man can try to say, well, we can figure that out, the fact is God says this is the authority structure. God, Messiah, man, woman. And so anything that alters or deviates from that um, then creates an author a confused authority structure. So according to God's word, polyamory, also a subset of po uh, polygyny, is sin. Additional problems that we have in the polyamory community would include, uh, or, or some might uh, add into this, open marriages, which we see in our culture today. And this is a result of uh, one or both parties in a marriage having relationships outside of that marriage. It's also fornication, uh, and it leads to a great deal of promiscuity and other problems. This is not a closed loop. This is very much an open and fluid situation with polyamory, um, and it's non-committal, okay, where Scripture desires a covenant relationship that is committed between the man and his woman or each of his women, okay? So polyamory fits into the sin category. If we look back at our umbrella, polygamy has polyandry and polyamory, and we see both of these with the big red X. Scripture very clearly eliminates these as possibilities. Polygyny is another subset of polygamy. Polygyny is polygune, where gune is the word for woman and poly, many. Uh, polygyny then would be multiple women and one man. And I want to state very clearly that this absolutely is not. It is never condemned by Scripture. What it is, is regulated by Scripture. What that means is that Scripture has boundaries or guidelines to how polygyny is to work. There are certain rules that it says you can't do this or you can't do that, but everything inside of those boundaries is okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 3, again, the authority structure, God, Messiah, man, woman, this does not violate the authority structure of God. It is not sin unless one of those regulations or restrictions is broken. St. Augustine, one of the church fathers in around 300 uh, AD, states in some of his writings, for by a secret law of nature, things that stand chief love to be singular, but things that are subject are set under, not only one under one, but even several under one. For neither has one slave several masters, in the same way that several slaves have one master. Thus we read that not any of the holy women served two or more living husbands, but we read that many females served one husband. For neither is it contrary to the nature of marriage. For several females can conceive from one man, but one female cannot conceive from several men. Such is the power of things principle. As many souls are rightly made subject to one God. So St. Augustine makes a very clear statement that polygyny is a legitimate form of God's authority structure and a legitimate expression of the way that um, things operate in the natural world. And we see this evidenced with a lion's pride. We see this evidenced with so many, many, many different uh, types of creatures where, you know, uh, out in the pasture, you'll have one bull and multiple cows. You'll have 
uh, you know, one ram and multiple goats or multiple sheep. You'll have uh, one buck and multiple goats, etc. So with, uh, with polygyny, there are uh, regulations, and those regulations specifically identify what uh, the, the boundaries or the guidelines for how a righteous polygynous uh, relationship is to operate. The first Exodus chapter 21 verse 10 specifically says that if a man takes a second wife, he is not to reduce the um, conjugal rights, the clothing, or the food of the first. The point being that uh, man's not to play favorites and he's not to take advantage of one over the other. He's to provide for both um, according to their needs and I would say somewhat in the direction of um, equally, but according to their needs is, the, uh, is probably the best interpretation. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 17 very specifically says that a man is not to marry a woman and her daughter. The intent being the, the verse by, it, by its very existence demonstrates that polygyny is okay as long as you don't violate that guideline, a woman and her daughter. And it's because God is very careful about not dividing up or breaking up family relationships, particularly blood relationships, and causing division there. Exactly the same concept is used in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 18, where it says, A man is not to marry a woman in addition to her sister as a rival. There's intent here, as a rival, while she is alive to uncover her nakedness. And so again, we do not want to see any division between blood relatives. Deuteronomy 17.17 17 is very specific. Deuteronomy 17.17 17 tells us that the king is not to multiply wives. Uh, the word rabbah in the Hebrew means excessive multiplication. It's not just adding one or two or five. This is huge, gross over, uh, over multiplication. Deuteronomy chapter 21 specifically says that the firstborn of the favorite wife cannot be made the firstborn of the family if he's not the true firstborn. Um, and, and that obviously speaks to the fact that sometimes there is favoritism. I don't think that's a good idea. It's a very, very bad idea. But the point is, is even in that circumstance, the man has to abide by certain rules that God puts in place, it says that you're not to cross this line. It's interesting to note that there are also among the conditions, there are no restrictions. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, the Leveret marriage law. Nowhere in that law does it say that the man is not required to or should not carry out the Leveret marriage law if he's already married. Already married is not a caveat against being able to or having, having the duty of fulfilling the Leveret marriage. Likewise, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 28 and 29 say, If a man finds a girl who is a virgin, who is not engaged, and seizes her and lies with her, and they are discovered, then the man who lay with her shall give her to, shall give to the father's girl's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall become his wife, because he has violated her and cannot divorce her all his days. Um, this sometimes is construed as a rape issue. It uh, is not necessarily that way. This may just be uh, an exuberant young man or an exuberant man and a woman that, uh, you know, they kind of just have the hots or whatever. The bottom line is that the man didn't follow proper protocol by seeking permission from the father and acquiring the woman rightly. Instead, takes advantage of the situation. In doing so, he's required to take her and keep her as his as his woman. There is no caveat in that, uh, in that passage that says if the man's already married, well, then you've got some other, some other situation. The situation is if the man has an unmarried virgin, uh, it specifically says a girl who is not engaged. She's not, she's not engaged. She's not, uh, not betrothed. She's not married. This is a woman that's available, and there's no comment about the marital status of the man. He's required to take her. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses uh, 10 through 14, is what is often termed the war bride uh, passage. And there's nothing in that passage that says, oh, this doesn't apply if the man is already married because he's not allowed to take a, a war bride. In fact, we see 
that that the expectation is is that if a man is at war and he sees a woman he takes her brings her home and has to follow these guidelines whether he's married or not so there are no restrictions specific to a married man not uh, not having to fulfill or carry out these laws so where there is no law there is no sin we see that in Romans chapter 4 15 5 13 1 John 3 4 Uh, points to the same thing. Violation of the law or transgression of the law is sin. Okay, so if there is no transgression of the law, there is no sin. I, I put this here so that we can make it very clear. There is no law against a man having more than one woman. It's not there. You will never find it. Search your Bible from beginning to end. It's not there. There are regulations on what a man is to do if he does have more than one Woman. So we see here then that polygamy, um, while it has multiple facets, scripturally there's only one that is allowed, and that is polygyny, a man with more than one woman, and that has to be within certain regulations that God gives. Now I want you to notice something here. I have had different pictures of uh, family units, family situations in these different slides. And some of those make people uncomfortable because they're like, ooh, you know, I, I don't know that I want to deal with that. You know, I, I think it's very interesting that when we get into the kingdom, we're going to have to deal with the fact that we get to face Jacob face to face. And Jacob had four wives, Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. And there are a lot of people in Christendom that get the icks when we start talking about polygyny as if somehow that's a a dirty thing. And yet there's no problem with it at all in God's eyes. And, And authors of Scripture, patriarchs of Scripture, kings, prophets, priests... We have examples of all of these through, um, through Scripture that have more than one wife, and God says not a word, Shh. not even a peep. So I want to look at five common objections that come up. There are lots of other objections and minor ones, but I think these are some of the major ones that we run into. Those common objections are the creation ideal, the fact that Jesus said, Maybe God never approved. That's a common one. Well, God never approved of it. Nothing good ever came of it. And often we'll hear something along the lines of or some some rephrasing of that was then, this is now. We don't do that anymore. Okay? So I want to look at each of these five common objections. The first is what, what is often called the creation ideal. What we're told is that Genesis 2.24 says, that uh, therefore a man shall leave his mother, father and mother, and a woman leave her home, and the two shall become one flesh. And we're told, oh, that's God's standard, okay? What they don't tell you is that the rest of that, that thought, that passage right there says that they were naked and unashamed. They also don't tell you that they were living in a garden, that God's the one who provided the bride, that God performed the ceremony, that God picked her out literally from Adam's rib and formed her so on and so forth. All these other things apparently should also be God's standard if that's the creation ideal. The fact is, none of those things uh, are held. The real purpose of that passage in Scripture is to say that when, when the man is joined to a woman, he is to leave his home and he's to form a new unit with her as a family structure. And if he adds a woman um, or adds another wife, Uh, She needs to also be joined to him in one flesh and not tied elsewhere, family, etc. Okay. We'll also often hear with the creation ideal, they'll say, uh, of speaking of all the polygynous situations we see in Scripture, they'll say, oh, description does not equal prescription. So the fact that God tells us about those situations, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David, because he tells us about those doesn't mean that that's a prescription. And yet they will use the description of Genesis 2.24 and tell us that that is a prescription. The whole creation ideal is a man-made doctrine, okay? If that is God's standard, then what about if a man never marries? Did he fail to meet God's standard? What's the penalty? What about the prophets that never married, like Jeremiah or Yeshua, um, the Messiah? 
What about uh, those who have more than one wife? They missed the creation standard. That's the, that, that's the point that they're making with this creation ideal, and yet there is no penalty. God penalizes not one person for that. What we do see in Scripture is that God supports marriage. Um, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, period. That's it. God supports marriage, and he expects marriage to be for life. He expects marriage to be a covenant that is not torn apart or not easily taken apart. Okay? Here's another, this is a great picture here. Um, Jesus said, uh, a lot of times people will point to Matthew chapter 19, 3 through 10, or one of the other gospels that touch on this passage where um, Yeshua, Jesus says, you know, in the beginning it was not so. And, uh, and he cites Genesis 2.24, but they don't bother looking at the context of this passage. It says that the, the rabbis came to Yeshua to test him, and they came testing him, asking about divorce. And we're told four times in this passage that the subject is divorce. And Yeshua's uh, comment with regards to divorce is that the marriage is indissoluble, okay? It cannot be torn apart. What's interesting is, is that nobody who's defending monogamy wants to go cite the parable of the ten virgins where Yeshua talks about taking, uh, having ten virgins that are waiting for his coming. He comes and he takes five into the marriage chamber. Huh. Sort that one out uh, for the monogamy-only activists. There are also those who say, well, the church is the bride of Christ, so that's a one-to-one. -one. And yet Yeshua himself speaks of multiple churches. Uh, in the book of Revelation, chapters uh, 2 and 3, he very specifically addresses the seven churches of Asia Minor, um, different, uh, different um, assemblies that are there. Scripture very clearly teaches us that God has more than one bride. He, he says that himself of himself on at least four different occasions. So others would say, well, God never approved. And yet here we have Joash who did what was right in the sight of the Lord. We find that in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 2 and 3. In one breath, you can read both of those verses. It says, Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. And Jehoiada gave him two wives who bore him sons and daughters. Joash had two wives. And during the life of Jehoiada the priest, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And apparently part of that was having two wives who bore him sons and daughters. So God approved of that one most definitely. Another good one is Genesis chapter 30, verse 18. Leah, upon bearing a, uh, I think this is her fifth son, says, God has given me my wages because I gave my husband my maidservant. And she named his, her, her newborn son Issachar, meaning wages or recompense. The point being that she ascribes to God the fact that she receives this blessing of another son because she gave her her handmaid to her husband as a wife. 2 Samuel 12 verse 8, God says of himself, I gave you your master's wives and your master's house into your hands, speaking to David. And he said, I would have added, or he said, I would have given you many more such things as this if you had only asked. David didn't ask. He went and did something he wasn't supposed to. He committed adultery by taking another man's wife. But he was never, ever, ever condemned, nor anybody else in Scripture ever condemned for taking an available woman to be his wife. Four times God mentions of himself or says of himself that he has more than one wife. I recommend you go look these passages up. But Jeremiah chapter 3, 6 through 10, he says that he divorced the house of Israel but did not divorce the house of Judah. You can't divorce half a woman, okay? He says in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 in the new covenant, he says that he made, behold, days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made in those days when I was an husband to them. In Jeremiah 33, 24, he talks about him having two families, the two families, house of Israel, house of Judah. And then in Ezekiel chapter 23, he's very clear when he says that before they left Egypt, before they got to Mount Sinai, he saw, he viewed 
Israel and Judah as two separate brides. And uh, he calls them a hola and a holaba. And he talks, uh, he, he decries the fact that they committed abominations with the Assyrians and with the Egyptians and with the pagan gods of the nations, um, even after he had blessed them with so much. But the point that he makes is they were his and they bore him sons and daughters. But he also goes so far as to say they were sisters, daughters of one mother, which is important when we understand Leviticus chapter 18, 18. So another objection that is commonly heard is that nothing good ever came of it. And yet I would counter with Jacob. God created the circumstances for Jacob and he brought about the 12 tribes by four wives. It's one of the best things that's ever happened in the history of the world. And it's through that family that God created and brought about his people. How about the Messiah? If you look at his lineage, how many polygynous uh, relationships or how many second, third, or fourth, or in the case of Bathsheba, eighth wives are in the lineage? Abraham had multiple wives. Jacob had multiple wives. David had multiple wives. Multiple kings in that lineage were polygynous. So you can't tell me nothing good ever came from it. That's a lie. Some will say, well, that was then, this is now. And I would say, God's law hasn't changed. Hasn't changed at all. God's law still stands. What was righteous uh, 6,000 years ago is righteous today. What was unrighteous 6,000 years ago is unrighteous today. God is very clear that he hates, he calls uh, unequal weights and measures an abomination. He doesn't like unequal weights and measures. He doesn't have a different standard of righteousness for different generations. How's that monogamy working out? Uh, we've, had, uh, we, we've largely been monogamous in Western culture for a long time, and we've allowed headship and patriarchy to go away. And in the process, um, that has resulted in a monogamous uh, disaster in the marriage world. Uh, we've got no-fault divorce. Essentially, most of, uh, most of Western civilization is polygynous. They just do it one woman at a time. Uh, would be serial, mon- you could call it serial monogamy, but it's really serial polygyny as opposed to uh, congruent uh, polygyny. And then we recognize that patriarchy has always been God's plan, and polygyny is an actual outworking and a righteous, visible manifestation of God's patriarchy and of Yeshua's relationship with multiple assemblies, multiple churches, multiple people. Each of us has cut co- is in covenant with him, okay? And throughout history, women have always, always needed covering um, or protection. So at this point, I I really want to pause for just a second and throw a great big honking warning sign up here. Okay, don't go there. A lot of people will listen to this. That might be the first time you're hearing this. And it's like, oh, goody, look what I can do. Well, I don't recommend that at all. Um, Number one, you need to make sure that your house is in order. And uh, just because you think it's in order, it probably isn't in order. If you want to find out who the head of your house is, just mention polygyny. One word, and you will find out whether or not you're the head of the house. Number two, Western women in general are ill-suited and poorly trained. We've been inculcated in this culture. Uh, We've been inculcated with this uh, monogamy-only jealousy and vindictive-inducing doctrine that is false. And the end result is, is that for women to participate in polygyny, they really have to do a lot of serious, deep down digging and dig out all kinds of crap that came out of this Western culture that is false. Western men in general lack the leadership skills and masculinity. Most of us have been raised in a feminized culture and are not prepared. Most men are not prepared without some significant internal work to come to a place where we're prepared to lead a house that has more than one woman in it. I strongly recommend that you seek the father first. If you're not making sure that the father is in this and you're just doing this on your own as the world is doing, chances are you'll have the same result there that that you would have in a regular monogamous marriage. Probably divorce, uh, fighting, uh, crazy, jealousy, um, headship issues, etc. And then lastly, I would say that if or when you do 
go down this road, commit. There is no back door. There's no outlet. Um, you need to understand that if you are if you are interested in what God says about marriage, you need to understand I hate divorce. That's what He says in Malachi chapter two verse sixteen. I hate divorce, and uh, that is not something that He wants. He never says I hate polygyny. It's not there. But He says I hate divorce. So you'd better get that one right. Okay, commit. I would, uh, I would wrap up here with a couple resources. Uh, go check out the rest of my YouTube channel. Okay, got lots and lots of videos, lots of things that instruction. If you go to my, um, my blog, notsov.com, and go to the Biblical Marriage tab, you'll find lots and lots of resources, books, um, other articles, uh, lots of different um, YouTube videos from other, uh, other sources that dig into this. Find out what Scripture really says. Find out and, and reform your thinking so that it's in line with what God's thinking is, not what traditional doctrine is. They don't call it biblical marriage because they know it, that it's not biblical. They call it traditional marriage because they know it's based on tradition that comes out of Greco-Romanism. Okay? I wrote a book titled Authority, Headship, and Family Structure According to Moses. It's available on Amazon.com. I strongly recommend that as it digs deep into the scripture, digs deep into authority and headship, uh, and that also deals with how to build a tribe, how to build a clan, um, and how you know what the purposes of this are. Okay. Another good resource where you can get other information is biblicalfamilies.org, and you go to the forum. You can read without even uh, having a membership. I know lots of people. I, I read there for months incognito before I came out of the shadows and joined the forum to have conversation and ask questions. Uh, another blog is 113restoration.com, which deals specifically with the restoration of God's authority structure. So I would conclude with this. Polygamy is an umbrella term. We talked about that. Some forms of polygamy are not sin according to scripture. What we do know is that polyandry and polyamory are clear violations of scripture, while polygyny is not sin if you stay within the simple guidelines that are regulations that God puts in place. So the last thing I would say is proceed with extreme caution. I look forward to, I I would love to hear your thoughts. I would love to hear your comments. Be sure to uh, put comments down in the, um, put some comments down here and let's have a discussion about this. Come visit the blog, uh, visit some of my other uh, YouTube videos on polygyny and what scripture has to say and refuting falsehood from uh, many different uh, different teachers that want to talk about the subject. But come, come check these out. Also, like, share, subscribe. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing from you and what you have to say, what your thoughts are.